Okay, so my name is Jacqueline and I'm a teaching and curriculum specialist here at the Eton Academy. Joining me today will be Wayfan and Hugh, who I'll introduce later, and we'll, together we'll be sharing with you some valuable tips and strategies that will help your child experience exam success in the upcoming PSLE. So before we begin, I'd like to make sure that you can see and hear us. So do give us a thumbs up in the reactions button at the bottom, or just use your thumbs up, or just wave hello so that I know that you can hear and see me clearly. Okay, thank you so much. Also, if you have any questions along the way, please uh, feel free to type your questions in the Zoom chat at the uh, Zoom chat function below. We will be collating the questions and uh, we'll try to answer them as we go along the session, or we will also uh, take some time to address them at the end of today's session. I'd also like to add that uh, we'll be recording the session and we'll send out the PowerPoint slides together with the recording after the webinar is over. Now, allow me to share with you a short introduction of the Eton Academy. The Eton Academy is part of the Distinguished Eton House International Education Group. We offer English, Mathematics, Science, and Richmond to children from nursery two all the way to primary six. Our programs are designed to nurture inquiring minds while equipping our students with the academic skills that they need to experience success. So here we have our founder, Mr. Ng Yixian who shares with us the background of how the Eton Academy began. Now, graduates from Eton House preschools have been saying how they missed the way they used to learn when they were in preschool. So the Eton Academy was set up so that we can continue supporting the students' learning as they progress on to primary school using the Eton House inquiry approach to fulfill MOE learning outcomes. So once again, today we will have with us Hugh, who is our senior teaching English teaching specialist. We have Weifen, our senior science teaching and curriculum specialist. And I am Jacqueline, uh, a math teaching and curriculum specialist here at the Eton Academy. Just a little bit about myself. I have had the opportunity to personally help prepare several students through this crucial exam in the last uh, 12 years of my experience. And today I'll be sharing with you some strategies that uh, I feel are useful in tackling the PSLE. Now here's an overview of what you will hear from me. Uh, we will first look at the components of the PSLE paper in 2023, followed by a close analysis of the exam question trends from 2020 all the way to 2022. And then I'll share some exam tips that will equip your child to stay calm and have clarity in tackling the PSLE. Lastly, we will look at how to prepare for the paper effectively and efficiently. So the PSLE math paper uh, is set to be on the 29th of September, which is just about four months away. And uh, right after the June holidays, your child will be sitting for his or her prelim paper. You should be, now be quite familiar with the math paper component, components and their weightage of marks. So we see here that the paper is split into two parts. There's paper one, which consists of booklets A and B. And your child will sit for this paper first thing in the morning, 8.15 to 9.15 a.m. And thereafter, there'll, there'll be a short little break and there'll be paper two, which will start at 10.30. And that would be one and a half hours. So your child re really, really needs the mental stamina to perform his or her best during the exam. Do ensure that they get enough sleep and rest the day before. Let's now dive into a topical analysis of the PSLE paper from 2020 to 2022 to see what the major topics your child might want to focus on in his or her revision. So the big four topics, fractions, ratio, percentage, and decimals, I've grouped them together because usually these uh, topics appear together in word problems, such as those that, that involve uh, the before change after concept, uh, for direct questions, you have conversions between percentage to decimals uh, or fractions to decimals and so on. And we see that uh, there's a consistent trend throughout the three years that the bulk of the mark allocation um, goes to this uh, big four topics. Now, other topics such as whole numbers, area and volume take up a, quite a significant amount of the mark weightage. We can see here that just these three major topics, the whole numbers, uh, the big four topics, and area and volume, make up about 66% of the entire paper. 
So if your child has a solid foundation in these topics, then I'd say that he or she should be able to pass the paper quite easily. I would also like to add that uh, geometry and statistics are worth paying attention to because these are the questions in paper two that take up um, four or five marks per question. Now that we know which are the topics uh, that are important to focus on, what does your child need to know next? Now, parents, I'm sure that you've heard about the heuristics countless times throughout your child's primary school journey. Now, these are mental shortcuts uh, and their approaches to problem solving. And this is why mental stamina is going to be very important because your child needs to have clarity in order to retrieve and apply the right heuristic to the problem. Of course, just knowing the heuristics does not guarantee a solution. Lots and lots of uh, practice is needed for your child to be able to identify the correct uh, heuristic, the key concepts in the question, and then uh, have practice to approach the problem with the correct steps. And with a lots of practice, then your child will be able to ensure mastery in solving word problems. Uh, students who have gone through the Eton Academy's curriculum have been exposed to these skills. They are thought, taught to identify key concepts through the mathematical language of the word problem and translate them into equations so that they will use the right approach in arriving at the correct solution. Now, we will also be conducting a special PSLE success camp during the June holidays. Um, just to get your child ready and prepared to do all that, all using all these heuristics with ease. Uh, later on, um, my colleague will be sharing with you more on the camp. And now let me take you through two PSLE questions to show you how we guide our students in their thinking so that they are able to tackle almost any problem that they see in the math paper. Okay, so before we tackle the paper, what are some exam strategies that your child needs to know? Well, he needs to know that if he, if he or she is not already doing this, he needs to be able to underline keywords and pick up important information from the question. Now, this helps to reduce transfer errors or misreading the question. And the ability to visualize a problem helps with their understanding as well. So many times I've heard students saying that they don't understand the question, but actually when we break it down and think about what each statement in the word problem means, they're actually able to solve the word questions on their own. Sometimes in their haste to finish the paper, the student might mix up formulas or forget about converting the units. So jotting down formulas and writing down the conversion between units will help to minimize this confusion. Before even writing down the solution to the problem, your child should be able to identify what heuristics to use, what key concepts can be applied in the question. So this will help your child to avoid getting a mental block. The golden rule to time management is to stick to one minute per mark. So let your, your child have this habit of wearing a watch during the exam and keeping time. Of course, he doesn't need to keep checking the time every minute, but to check the time in blocks. So for example, after finishing 15 MCQ questions, which, takes, which is about 20 marks, so that should, should take about 20 minutes. And if you're stuck at a question, then don't spend more than a minute on that question. Circle that question and move on and come back to it later. For open-ended questions and word problems, encourage your child to write all the solutions neatly and in a sequential order. Number statements should be written in the middle of the page and working should be in a column on the right. They do this because they can get awarded method marks even if the answer is wrong or incomplete. So I always tell my students, please don't let the marker hunt for your answers because then you're going to lose a lot of precious marks. And lastly, after they have finished the paper, uh, check, always, always check their work. But I know uh, for a fact that students actually don't know how to check their work. So when we say check your work, we need to tell them explicitly what they should be checking for. They should be checking for any calculation error. They should be checking whether they've transferred their numbers and answers correctly. They should be checking whether they wrote their units down, especially in paper two. And if there's time, if there is time, they can reread the question 
redo the question mentally in their head and check that they did not uh, misunderstand or misread anything in the, in the question. Okay, so now let me take you through the thinking process of how the Eton Academy students uh, think when they encounter an exam question. This is a question I've taken from the PSLE 2022 paper one, uh, and there are several concepts uh, in angles being tested here. So your child needs to know how to infer what information is needed to solve this question. Now, first, let's read the question one statement at a time, okay? So the first statement says, um, a rectangular piece of paper is folded. Now, what are the key concepts in here? Okay, I see that first there is an image of um, a square and triangles. I see angles and shapes. So I know this question is testing me the concept of angles. I see the word rectangular. So I know, okay, a rectangle has four angles. Each angle is 90 degrees. I see that the paper is being folded. So a paper fold me means that there is a line of symmetry and therefore the angles to the left and the right of that fold will, are equal. Next, I see the word trapezium. So in a trapezium, I know that the sum of angles within parallel lines is equal to 180 degrees. Okay, so what's next? I need to visualize that problem or I can mark whatever I have, I have just thought about into my diagram in pencil. So this is what my figure should look like now. And then I will repeat this whole process with the next state statement. Now the next statement says that two shaded triangles are identical. So what does that tell me? It tells me that shaded triangles, um, these two shaded triangles are identical. So the lengths and the angles are the same within the triangle. The middle unshaded triangle is an isosceles triangle. Therefore, two of its interior angles are equal. And the sum of angles in a triangle is equal to 180 degrees. So I'll go ahead and do my markings on the figure and it should look like this now. Then next, I will go to the, the final statement, which is the question and, and see what the question is asking for. So in this case, we're going to find angle X. Now, now that I have uh, thought through the question, I know what they're trying to ask me, I can start doing the question. Let's go to the given angle, 73 degrees. And what I've done is to label the, the parts, some points in the, in the figure so that I'm able to, if I need to, I can always go back and know where this angle is. So I've labeled points U and T and angle RQT is 180, taking, take away 73, take away 90, and that will give me 17. So I'll mark in my figure where the 17 degrees are. And next, I will find angle PQU which is 90, take away the 17 and another 17, which will give me 56. I'll go ahead and mark that angle in the figure. And finally, I can find my angle X, which is inside that isosceles triangle. So 180, take away 56, take away 56, and I will arrive at the answer, which is 68. Okay, again, so what I've done is to label the angles in the figure with a pencil, uh, insert the extra points where I, that I can label my steps. And then when I'm done, I just go back to the question again, make sure I'm finding the correct thing, angle X. Okay, so here's another question. I have um, a question from the 2022 paper two, question 17. Now this question is, um, uh, is quite a long word problem and there are some heur uh, heuristics that I might need to apply. So this is what my thought process would be like. Okay, so again, read one statement at a time. Think about what each statement means, what are the heuristics or key concepts I can apply. Visualize the problem or mark on the question given in pencil, and then repeat the steps again until the whole question has been read and identify what the question is asking for. Okay, so let's go into the question. I'll give you about one minute to read through it on your own. Okay, so as I read the question, the first sentence, this is what I'm thinking. Since I'm given the total number and the ratio, I can find the number of large and small cakes. In the second sentence, I see that she decorated them with cherries. Now, this is another item mentioned in this question, so I have to pay attention to what this other item means. My next st statement tells me that 
a number of cherries are put onto each large and small cake and they are given uh, in a ratio form. So I have to remember that this is in ratio and these are just unit, a unitary representation. So I have two different things here. I have the number of cakes and I have the number of cherries. So a heuristic that comes to mind is to simplify this problem. And the key concept here will be to use number times value. The last information here is that there are 204 cherries. So this is the actual number of cherries used to decorate all the small cakes and seven large cakes. So since I have this information, in using the number times value, I will need to form one group, and that one group is made up of the cherries in the small cakes and the seven large cakes. Now let's identify the question. Part A is asking for the number of small cakes. And remember, just now in that first sentence, we already identified how we can find the number of large and small cakes. So this is my first step. I write down my ratio. Okay, I assign the number of units, which is eight units, to 40. I find one unit, and then I find three units, which represents the small cakes. So I arrive at 15 for my answer for part A, and that's already one mark. Now, second question, how many cherries did Mrs. Lee use for all the small cakes? So in order to find that, I form one group. Remember, I use the, second, the first and the second information together. So forming one group, I have 15 times 2 plus 7 times 3, which is 51 units worth of cherries on these cakes. And 51 units is represented by 204 cherries, which is the actual value. By dividing these two numbers, I get four groups. Since I have four groups, I can find the total number of cherries used on my small cakes, and that is 120. And that's part B, and I got my two marks. In part C, the question is asking for how many more cherries Mrs. D needs for the remaining large cakes. Now, they're asking about large cakes, so I need to go back and find the number of large cakes first. Okay, I found that it is 25. And then the remaining large cake, so that's 25, take away 7, and that will give me 18, okay? And then in the last step, I will be able to find the number of cherries used per large cake by taking the total just now, 204, minus the small cakes, which is 120, and that would give me 84 cherries on the 7 large cakes. Taking 84 divided by 7 will give me 12 cherries on each large cake. Now I'm able to find the number of remaining cherries, which is 12 times 18, and that's 216. And that will be my final answer. Now it sounds like it's very complex, but what your child will learn at the Eton Academy will really help them to sharpen their skills in being able to identify these key concepts and being able to answer these kind of questions easily. Okay, so lastly, we'll talk about your revision game plan. How uh, is your child going to study effectively and efficiently? First, uh, coming up with a revision schedule uh, will be very useful for them because uh, it's just four more months to a PSLE. How, can, how are they going to uh, make use of their time efficiently? So don't just focus on doing papers. In this revision time, plan out uh, specific topics that your child might be weaker in and also uh, why a schedule is important is so that they can space out their revision and, and not cram everything uh, all at once. Okay, so to revise your paper efficiently as well, uh, you might want to practice relevant sections of the paper based on your previous scores. Uh, I'll not go through the information here, but generally, if your child is scoring below 60, then 60%, uh, then uh, to focus on paper one would be. Uh, more ideal because that's where they might be losing their marks to, to, to build up their foundation first. And also when practice, practicing papers, they should practice in a time setting. So you can break, you can break down the entire paper into smaller bite-sized parts, for example, uh, doing booklet A. So trying to complete booklet A within 30 minutes, trying to complete booklet B within 25 minutes. Okay, and then once they can, once they can do that, and then uh, combine, do booklet A and booklet B together within a certain time. So start small. The key is to start small and to build your mental stamina from there. Okay, so I know that was a lot that I've just shared. So here are just three key takeaways for you. 
So first, uh, we want to remember that uh, practicing identifying heuristics and key con concepts in questions will be very helpful for your child to be able to solve these questions uh, quickly and correctly. They should always show their solutions clearly in a sequential order so that they are able to gain maximum marks. And lastly, to check for calculation errors, check for transfer errors, check for missing units when they're done with the questions. So with that, I have now come to the end of my sharing. I will now hand over the time to our senior science teaching and curriculum specialist, Wei Fen. Wei Fen, please. Thank you, Jacqueline. Hey, good evening, parents. I'm Wei Fen, and I'll be sharing with you on science. Yeah, I've been teaching science uh, for over 10 years, and during this time, I've gained valuable insights on some of the challenges that I faced when it comes to science examinations. Okay, it is uh, sometimes disheartening to see students making avoidable mistakes while answering questions. However, yeah, I believe with the right guidance and support, these mistakes can be minimized and students can excel in the, in the subject. Okay, this is the overview okay, of my sharing. Okay, I will briefly touch on okay, the overview of the primary science topic, followed by strategies for tackling multiple choice questions. Okay, and then I'll be sharing some common pitfalls in answering open-ended questions. And lastly, strategies for answering open-ended questions. Okay, here's an overview of the lower block and upper block topics for science. Okay, it is important to note that certain key concepts they okay, learn in the lower blocks are fundamental for understanding specific topics in the upper blocks. One such example is the P4 topic on heat. Okay, the concepts of heat gain and heat loss covered in this topic is essential for the primary five topics on water, as well as the P6 topic on adaptations. Therefore, it is crucial for students to not only uh, revise the primary five topics and the primary six topics, but also to have a solid understanding of the concepts learned in primary three and primary four. Here's a breakdown of the science paper. Here's a one hour and 45 minutes paper. Okay, two booklets. Booklet A consists of multiple choice questions. Okay, 28 questions. Okay, two marks, two marks each. Okay, and over any questions. Okay, uh, for booklet B, okay, 12 to 13 questions, okay, ranging okay, from two to five marks. Okay, allow me to share with you some strategies that students can use when tackling multiple choice questions. Okay, one crucial step okay, is to read the entire questions carefully, ensuring that they don't uh, overlook any details and highlighting any clues or keywords provided. Okay, some students think that they know what a question is asking for okay, before reading it and they jump straight okay, to the most logical answer. Okay, however, such actions can cost them dearly on multiple choice questions, which is worth two marks per question. Okay, some students may find long questions accompanied by diagrams, tables, graphs, daunting. However, some of such questions are actually not as difficult as, it, as they appear to be. Okay, students just have to read the questions carefully and as students analyze the questions, it can also jot down important points along the way. Okay, writing down important points uh, helps students to organize their thoughts and prevent them from overlooking uh, important details that is given in the questions. Okay, another strategy is that students, uh, students should adopt is the elimination method. Okay, I always tell my students that when they eliminate any options, they must be able to justify with scientific concepts okay, and some reasoning on why they eliminate the options. This ensure that, they, that the options that they have chosen is the correct choice. Okay, it is also essential for students to select the best answer to the question being asked. Okay, and not just an answer that seems correct. Okay, let me show you how we can apply some of the strategies shared earlier okay, in answering multiple choice questions. Okay, so first, okay, students will read a question and highlight uh, the important points. Okay, for example, keep dry pieces of a type of paper to the upper and lower surfaces of a leaf. Okay, the paper turned pink when wet. Okay, even the axis on the graph, right? Okay, it's also key information for students to take note. Okay, so from this graph, okay, they should know that shorter time taken for paper to turn pink means that more water paper is being produced. Okay, let us look at all the answer options. Okay, for option one, okay, it is incorrect because plant pee at 30 degrees Celsius actually lost less water. 
Okay, for option two, it is also incorrect because the data did not show if the number of stomata were changed with temperature. Okay, for option three, it is incorrect because if there is more opening on the upper surface, there should be more water loss and shorter time for the paper to turn pink. Okay, for option four, it is correct because shorter time is taken for, pa uh, for paper to turn pink at both temperatures. Okay, let's look at another example okay, uh, of a questions on magnets. Okay, so again, we will highlight the key information. Okay, and based on Ricci observation, which of the following statements are definitely correct? Okay, I would also like to highlight the word correct because sometimes the question might be asking for incorrect statements. Okay, so let's look at the options. Okay, A, both magnets were attracted to each other in the above setup. Oops, sorry. Okay, it's, uh, it's incorrect, okay, because this is not observed in a setup. B, magnetism can pass through no magnetic material. It is correct because based on the uh, diagram, okay, magnetism can pass through the plastic bottle for the magnets to be attracted to the clips. Part C, okay, magnets are stronger at their poles. Okay, some students might uh, choose these options, okay, but actually this is an incorrect option because although it's a correct concept, uh, it is a correct concept, but it's not demonstrated in the experiment. And in the questions, okay, I've highlighted based on Ricci's observation. So students have to take note on that. Okay, for part D, some of the clips are made of non-magnetic material. Okay, it is incorrect because okay, um, all the clips are made of the same material. Okay, let's look at some uh, common pitfalls okay, students face in uh, answering open-ended questions. Yes, some students might identify the wrong uh, topic and apply the wrong concept to answer the questions. Sometimes, okay, students fail to uh, understand what a question is asking for. Students might also misinterpret data in tables and graphs. Okay, and some students think that writing more is better and safer. They tend to write uh, lengthy answers and give too much unnecessary information with no clear key concepts mentioned. Okay, and sometimes if their answers contradict each other, okay, or review a wrong concepts, okay, their uh, marks might be deducted instead. Okay, students also tend to miss out on questions that require drawing or labeling as students only look up for lines to answer the questions. Some students, uh, their answers tend to be too general okay, and students give incomplete answers with no elaborations, okay, with no keywords, okay, or sometimes inaccurate uh, terms are used. Okay. And when the questions have uh, two or more setups, students are required to compare the setups. Okay, it is important for them to use comparison words such as more, least, and strongest. Okay, let me share with you some common questions and strategies on how to answer them. Okay, let's look at these questions. It's a 2020 PSI question. It seems like a very direct question, okay, uh, whereby uh, uh, it asks for the definitions, okay, uh, state what boiling means. Okay, let's look at some of the um, students' responses. Okay, boiling is a change of state from liquid to gas at 100 degrees Celsius. Student two, boiling is a change of state from liquid to gas due to heat gate. Would you accept these answers? Okay, let's look at the expected res uh, expected. Uh, Answers. Okay, boiling is a change of state from liquid to gas due to heat gain at a fixed temperature. So when answering such question, okay, for the various processes, okay, students must remember to write the change in state. Okay, whether is it from liquid to gas? Okay, whether there's a gain or loss of heat during the process. Okay, and if the process occurs at a fixed temperature, and students must also take note that, okay. Melting, freezing, and boiling. Okay, only melting, freezing, and boiling it occurs at a fixed temperature. Okay, let's look at the next question. It's taken from a 2021 PSLE. Uh, the topic is life cycle of animals. Okay. okay. Again, we will highlight the key information okay, in the questions. And students okay, have to describe what George could conclude about the effect of temperature on the hatching of mosquito eggs. 
So these are two common responses by students. Okay, and we have to take note of the mark allocated to these questions, two marks. So uh, if you look at students' one answer, okay, you, will, you will see that actually he, he or she is not writing enough okay, to be awarded the full marks. So here is the expected answer. Okay, as the temperature increased from 22 degrees Celsius to 28 degrees Celsius, number of eggs that hatch in a day increased. Okay, as the temperature increased from 28 to 38 degrees Celsius, the number of eggs that hatch in a day decreased. Okay, these kind of questions, I'll call it a two-trend relationship questions. Okay, this, this kind of question is not difficult, okay, but students okay, generally do not do well in them. Okay, they are not difficult as they don't require students to recall any concepts. Whatever students need, okay, are all in a question itself. And in this case, it is a table. Okay, students usually do not score well for this question as they only write uh, on one trend, okay, like student one, or like student two, they do not specify the specific points from what to what. And, is, and in this question, it is a specific temperatures that we are looking for. Okay, let's look at another questions. Okay, it's a 2020 PSRE questions on electrical system. So again, we will highlight the key points. And from the diagram, students should know that it is an electromagnet questions. Okay, and students have to explain how the door was unlocked okay, when Peter closed the switch. Okay, let's look at two sample responses by students. Okay, so as we can see, the, the responses are not uh, complete. Okay, so for this kind of electricity questions, okay, there's actually a four-step explanation format okay, for students to answer the questions. So first, okay, they have to talk about the action, okay, whether is it the opening or closing of the switch. Second, the circuit, whether it leads to an open or closed circuit. Okay, third, okay, the flow of the electricity, whether electricity can flow or not. And lastly, the outcome. Let's look at the expected responses. Uh, let's look at the expected answer. Okay, number one, action. Okay, when a switch was closed, okay, two, circuit, okay, a closed circuit was formed. Okay, third, electricity can flow through the coils around the metal cylinder. And fourth, the outcome. Okay, the outcome is the metal cylinder was magnetized to become an electromagnet. The electromagnet can attract okay, the iron bolt causing the door to unlock. Okay, let's look at the last question. This is a, uh, a PSI question taken from 2019. Okay, so the key information is uh, air conditioned cat car. Okay, Alice put her hands over her spectacles, but Beatrice did not. Okay, there's less fogging on Alice's spectacles, and students okay, have to explain why there's less fogging on Alice's spectacles. So here are the keywords for condensation. Okay, warmer water vapor from uh, came into contact with cooler inner or outer surface of lost heat to condense okay, to form water droplets. So these type of condensation questions are very common in most school examinations and PSLE, but different kinds of scenarios are given instead. Okay, so the answer uh, frame is always the same and students must demonstrate their ability to apply the six points okay, that is mentioned here to address the question. So in the ETA Academy, we make use of mnemonic to help students to remember certain concepts. Okay, so, so for uh, these concepts, okay, we use okay, the mnemonic, very confident who leopard can dance. Okay, so the use of the mnemonic in these questions helps students to check and, and ensure that they do not miss out any essential point in their answer. Okay, so this is the uh, expected answer. Okay, um, because Alice covered her spectacles with her hands, okay, her spectacles gain heat from her hand and become less cold than Beatrice's spectacles. So under the concepts, these are actually the six points that I've mentioned in the previous slide. Okay, and therefore, less fogging is observed on Ellie's spectacles. And for these questions, students must remember to use comparison words like less, okay, because they're comparing between Alice and Beatrice. Okay, here are some tips, okay, uh, for science examinations, okay. So uh, I would advise students to complete booklet A first, 
Why? Because booklet A has a bigger weightage, okay, and it's two marks per questions. Okay, and if students cannot recall specific concepts when answering open-ended questions, okay, some of the key terms that appear in the multiple choice questions can actually be used as a reference for students okay, for booklet B. Okay, and students should aim to spend about 30 to 35 minutes to complete booklet A, okay, leaving about 10 to 15 minutes okay, for checking. Okay, and when they are when they check their work, okay, do make sure that okay, they must make sure that they don't miss out any pages and also check whether they have written enough points okay, for the marks awarded for each question. Okay, I've come to the end of my sharing. To sum up, number one, okay, reading the questions carefully is important. Number two, okay, take the time to highlight clues and keywords that can guide students towards the correct answer. Okay, third, okay, analyze the questions with patience. Jot down in important points along the way for better organization and clarity. Okay, use by using a strategy shared and fostering a strong foundation in science. Okay, students will definitely show an improvement in the subject. Okay, I will now hand over to Hugh, who will be sharing with you on English. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Wei Fen. Um, my name is Hugh, and I've been teaching for about twenty three years. So uh, I've been in the MOE school. So I have gone through the system, I've marked PSLE papers and so, so I have a pretty good idea of what they are looking out for, for the PSLE exams, right? Okay, so I'm going to dive right in, KPSLE English, and for English, okay, this is what your kids will be doing, right? There are four different papers, yeah? Uh, paper one, that's your writing paper. Paper two, that's more on reading comprehension. Uh, paper three is your listening and paper four is your oral exam. Of course, your paper three and paper four will all be done before paper one and two, which is done on the actual PSLE uh, examination day, right? Um, if you notice, uh, obviously the, the marks are different for each different section, okay? And today we're gonna talk about composition writing. As you can see in paper one, that takes up uh, 40 marks, okay? That's the bulk of it, right? And for paper two, right? The three sections at the end, compre close, synthesis and transformation, and comprehension open-ended. Yeah, those are the sections that take up the most marks as well, okay? So we're gonna focus on these areas uh, of the paper. Okay, so let's start with composition writing, okay? Um, yeah, basically when your child writes a composition, okay, he or she will be assessed according to two main categories, uh, content and language. And it's an equal weightage of 20 marks each. So the total will be 40 marks. This is an example of a PSLE question back in uh, 2020. Okay, so the, the question looks like this, right? Write a composition of at least 150 words about something that was lost. Okay, so what's really important for your child to take note of is that he or she must address the theme. Okay, so in this case, right, uh, they have to write about something that was lost. That is what the story has to be about, okay? And the theme must be crucial in this story. Okay, you, the, the reader has to be able to associate the story with the theme after reading the story, yeah? Now also, if you notice uh, in the middle there, there's an instruction there which says, your composition should be based on one or more of these pictures. They will be given three different pictures, right? Okay, and uh, a, a very common uh, question I get from students uh, and parents would be, should they use all the pictures, all right? Can they just use one of the pictures? And the answer to that is, of course, just use one and that's enough, okay? It doesn't mean that if you use two pictures or three pictures, you're gonna get a higher score, all right? Um, actually, sometimes if you force the story to include more than one picture, it might actually harm the story. It might actually make things worse, okay? So pick a picture that, uh, you know, you think you can write the most interesting story about and just go with that. Okay, so this was back in 2020, right? Okay, now the other thing, of course, is uh, in 2021, okay, the, the, the theme of this one was a promise. And as you can see, the three pictures there, 
All right, so you can see uh, what's going on. The girl's writing a note. There's a there's a watch, and there's a there's a hamburger, <laughs> and that's the final picture, right? Okay. Now remember that uh, when you write this story, okay, sometimes it's not very clear as to what exactly the conflict of the story is. Now, again, I keep telling students this, right? In every story that you write, there has to be some sort of conflict. Something has to go uh, wrong or something unusual has to happen. Because if, if everything just happens normally, then it's not much of a story, right? Sometimes the theme doesn't make it clear what the conflict is. Like in this case, it's a promise, okay? So what is the conflict here? Okay, that's where they really would need to think of their own conflict, yeah? So I would say these types of uh, uh, questions, these types of themes might be a little trickier, yeah? Um, the other thing to take note of is that there are some questions in the middle, okay? As you can see here, uh, it says, consider the following points. What was the promise and was the promise kept? Now, these are crucial points in the story, yeah, so uh, students are expected to answer these questions in their story as well. Now, if they don't do that, most likely they won't, won't score uh, that well for content because this, these two questions are actually very crucial if you think about it, right? Okay, so obviously if you say it's a promise, you must explain exactly what was this promise, right? And was it kept, right? These are very important points to, to uh, include in the story, yeah? Now, so um, having said that, right, so how do we uh, write stories that are good, right? How do we get a higher score for composition writing? Yeah. Uh, firstly, does my story address the theme and is the picture a central part of it? That's really important, okay? The theme and the picture must go hand in hand, right? Sometimes I tell my uh, students, right, if you remove the picture from your story, your story really shouldn't make any sense at all. So the, that picture is really crucial in your telling of the story, okay? That's really important. Don't just mention the picture in passing, okay? Like if you recall earlier on, there was a picture of an information counter. That was from the first uh, example there. If you just mentioned, oh, I went to the information counter and, uh, and then after that you left and you did all kinds of other things and the information counter is not part of your story anymore, then that's not really a good use of that picture, okay? That picture has to be crucial to your story. Does my story follow the narrative structure? Okay, so again, remember that stories should have some kind of structure, okay? And in, at the Ethan Academy, of course, we learn the, the very, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, well-used uh, narrative structure of having a beginning, a conflict, resolution, and end, yeah? So that's something that most students are able to do. Um, if they miss out any of these points, okay, that will probably affect your content as well. Okay, and of course, the other thing that we must remember is that language is also very important. Okay, so the students use a wide variety of, uh, of vocabulary and also different writing techniques. Okay, now before I go on to talk about writing techniques, if you see in, the, in that little uh, pop-up there, right, for your student to do really well, Okay, I advise students to think of stories that are unlikely, but possible. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Um, you know, when you tell a story, what makes interesting stories would be if the reader doesn't expect something to happen. Yeah, so if something unusual happens, that makes a good story to tell, right? So that's something that they should be thinking about. Okay, uh, one year during a PSLE, there was a story about how a tiger was in a mall. All right, and um, and everyone's thinking, how can a tiger be in a mall? That's so un that's so uh, unusual, right? But the student went on to explain how you know the mall was next to the zoo and the tiger escaped from the zoo, and that's how it ended up there. So that gave it a very good explanation, and because of that, that that student did really really well for that for that uh, composition. Okay, so that's just an example. Yeah. Um. Okay. Let me go on to writing techniques here. So what exactly are writing techniques? So at the Ethan Academy, we learn about uh, how to use all these different uh, techniques, things like show, not tell, uh, using dialogue and, uh, you know, or internal dialogue, right? Personal thoughts, 
Uh, how do we use the five senses in our writing to describe things that are going on? Uh, and of course, the various forms of figurative writing, like similes, metaphors, personification, things like that, right? So all of these techniques would actually um, boost up their language score if they use them correctly, of course. And not just that, if they use good language techniques, it also helps with the content. Because as a reader, and you, you know, if you read a very good description, it really builds up the story as well, builds up the content as well, okay? So these are the things that they need to uh, consider when uh, writing a composition. Okay, uh, one more important uh, note, okay? In uh, writing stories, I think many students forget that there are main characters in the story, okay? It's good that we focus on the main characters. In other words, spend a bit of time developing the characters itself, okay? So I tell the students uh, this as well. If they're reading a story, for example, let's say Harry Potter, if we, we, if we didn't know anything about Harry Potter, we really wouldn't care, you know, what happens to him, right? Because we know about him, we know about his background, we are keen to find out what he's going to do next, yeah? So same thing for their own composition writing. If they give us something a bit about the characters, then the reader has an uh, has a vested interest to find out what the character what's going to happen to the character. Yeah, it kind of like uh, makes the reader more interested in in uh, the outcome of the story this way, right? So that's that's a tip for for everyone. Now. I'm going to move on to comprehension open-ended. Okay, so that's also a major part of the exam. Okay, worth 20 marks. And for comprehension open-ended, okay, for, for students to do well, okay, first thing is they have to read the text very closely. Okay, now I have this uh, issue with some students where they just read the text and they just kind of like skim through it. They kind of just, okay, I know the story is just like this. Uh, it happens this way. But they don't take time to read very closely to, to ask themselves questions as they read. You know, to ask themselves, why did the character do this? Or why did the character say that? What does this refer to? What does this mean? So all these questions should be popping up in their head as they are reading the text already. Yeah. Um, then, of course, we would have to look at the questions and identify what kind of question it is. Nowadays, the, for PSLE especially, there are more inferential questions. Okay, I'll talk about that in a bit. Yeah, there are more inferential questions where the students need to actually uh, put in a, lip, uh, a bit more uh, brain power. They have to think a bit harder to get the answers. Yeah, the, it's not so direct. And of course, after they've written down their answers, they have to check that they have uh, fulfilled the requirements of the question. Okay, that's important. Okay, checking is really important, okay, especially when it comes to comprehension. Okay, so direct and inferential questions, right? I mentioned this just now. Now, direct questions are those that you can directly get the answer from the passage. It's pretty straightforward, you know, it's directly there. You just look at the passage, you can pretty much pick out most of the words to write in the answer, okay? So those are direct questions. Inferential questions, basically you need to use a bit of your prior knowledge. You need to use clues in the passage. You need to basically, as I said earlier, put in a little more brain power, okay? And as I mentioned earlier, uh, nowadays, right, there are more inferential questions in the PSLE comprehension text. So that's something for your kids to look out for. Okay, now let's let's look at an example of an inferential question, okay, from a from the paper in 2019. Yeah. Okay, the question says, uh, what does the nickname the brain tell you about Brian? Based on line study in the 20, explain why this nickname was appropriate for him. Okay, so. Um, we, first thing for inferential questions, okay, we have to uh, draw on prior knowledge. So basically when I, when we use the term the brain, okay, what does that usually mean, right? Okay, and then we got to uh, think of clues or look for clues rather in the passage itself. So in the passage, Brian gave some suggestions to solve a certain problem, okay, right? And from there, 
we kind of like, you know, use what we know, use what we, we uh, you know, the clues on the passage and we come up with this answer. The nickname suggests that Brian was intelligent. Okay, so the brain intelligence, right? Uh, and he was able, uh, and why, why do we say that? Because he was able to suggest solutions to solve the problem of the missing backdrop. So that was from the passage itself, okay? So this is an example of an inferential question. Now also take note, um, for each question, they will tell you the mark allocation. So if it's worth two marks, more, uh, most likely there would have to be more than one point, probably two points that they have to put in, just like in this uh, answer here, yeah? Okay, I'm going on to synthesis and transformation now. And um, the trickier ones, the trickier questions would be when they would need to do some sort of word transformation. Okay, now again, this is from a PSLE paper. I believe this was last year's paper. Okay, and the question is, Vasanti lost her mobile phone. She reported it to the police. Okay, now they are supposed to transform this, right? And they're given Vasanti reported the something. Okay, yeah. Um, how about you guys try this, right? Parents, try this out, okay? Uh, what do you think the answer should be here? How do we actually uh, transform this? Okay, let me just give you like 10 seconds or 20 seconds. Yeah, maybe 10 seconds, right? Can you just type in the chat and let's see if you're able to get the answers, okay? Give you 10 seconds. Okay, all right. Let, right, let me just share now with you, okay? First thing, we have to look at the word lost here, okay? And we need to transform this word, right? So we have to transform this to the noun form because of the way the sentence is structured, right? So Vasanti reported the what, so the thing, right? So that's why it's a noun, the noun form. So the loss of her mobile phone to the police. Now also notice, right, it's not just the loss, it's the loss of. Okay, so your child also needs to know um, the word collocations here. She need, he or she needs to know what comes after the word lost here. Okay, so it's not really that straightforward now, is it? Yeah, okay, but all this comes with, again, the usage of the language and knowing that you need to use a noun after reported the what, right? And it has to be loss of. The word of has to come after the word loss here. Yeah? Okay, let me show you another example. Okay, now one of the very common uh, questions they will face would be direct to reported speech, yeah? So this again uh, is from a past PSLE paper. And the question is, Paul asked Amy, why did you, uh, why did you sing this song? Okay, so we are supposed to transform this now uh, from direct to reported speech. Okay, this is a bit trickier because it is in the form of a question. Right, but when we transform this, it's no more and should not be in the form of a question, right? It should be in a statement form. Okay, what uh, we learn is that for direct reported speech, a few things need to be changed. Okay, tenses that's the first thing. Uh, we need to look at pronouns, we need to look at place words, and we need to look at time words. Okay, so if I look at this, right. Well, um, how would I how would I transform this sentence? Okay, all right. You can try typing your answer in the Zoom chat. Let me give you another ten seconds or so. <laughs> Okay, all right, let's have a look here. So what do we do here? Okay, so first thing we need to look at the tense, right? The tense. So why did, did you sing this song? So that needs to be changed, right? You, that's a pronoun that also needs to be changed. This, this is, uh, this is a, a place word, right? So that also needs to be changed. And answer would be, Paul asked Amy why she had sung. So did is in the past tense. Your child needs to know that if it's a past tense, it now has to become the past perfect tense. So the word had is important. And because it's had, it has to be had sung. That's your past participle, sing, sang, sung, right? So that, that's the first thing, uh, you know, they need to do, all right? And, of, and also, 
right? You has to be she now because Amy is the girl, right? So Paul asks Amy. And this, that place word now has to become that, okay? Because you're reporting on something that was already said earlier. That's why we need to make all these changes. Hmm? Reported speech is something that um, you can almost guarantee will come out, right? Most of the years, at least one question is on reported speech, right? So this is quite a, quite a sure thing, I would say. Okay, um, I'm going to finally talk about comprehension close. Okay, so to deal with comprehension close, it's important that your child is familiar with phrasal verbs and word collocation as well, okay? Uh, that, that's one of the possible uh, types of questions they would, they would ask, okay? So like in this example here, Sweden's culture frowns blank, throwing food away and has invented creative recipes for reinventing leftover food. Okay, so here, yeah, it is a phrasal verb, right? And when you see the word frowns, you should know what the next word is. And I hope you know you do know that answer, right? So it's frowns upon or frowns on. I think it's both, both are accepted, okay? And again, this comes from your child's knowledge of phrasal verbs. So if he or she is unfamiliar, it's going to be really difficult for them to pick this answer, yeah? So one more tip for you. Uh, although, yes, we only have about four months left, maybe every night, you know, get your kids to go through phrasal verb lists, common ones, phrasal, phrasal verb lists, uh, word collocations as well. Just learn a few every night, okay? Uh, by the time they hit PSLE, they would have amassed quite a few already. I mean, not to mention they already know quite a few uh, through the daily reading as well, okay? So it's good to, to do that kind of uh, nightly uh, revision or nightly learning, I would say, yeah? Okay, just so uh, recap, I've said quite a bit as well, right? Just uh, for composition, uh, very important, follow the theme. Make sure the chosen picture is key to the story, right? So the theme and the chosen picture has to be central to the story, yeah? Uh, comprehension open-ended, definitely read the text closely. Analyze the question. So at, at the Aten Academy, we practice this uh, method called RACER, where we analyze the question to make sure that they are giving uh, the answer uh, they're fulfilling the question requirements, basically, yeah? Uh, synthesis and transformation, the more difficult ones would be when they need to transform words themselves. So that, that would be something important, like knowing how to change an adjective to a noun, a noun to an adjective, you know, things like that. So definitely you need to be familiar with that. And of course, direct to reported speech, as I mentioned, uh, very often the, uh, a question like that would come out for PSLE, okay? Uh, for comprehension close, definitely review phrasal verbs and word collocations as well, okay? Okay, um, right. So very quickly, before uh, we take uh, some of your questions, I'm going to talk to you about the June holiday program, which is coming up. And uh, it's happening in June, obviously, uh, from Monday to Friday. So it's a five-day program from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And this happens for all three subjects, English, uh, maths, as well as science. Okay, so they'll be held uh, in three separate weeks. So your child can actually attend all three. Yeah. And where, uh, where is this held? Basically in all our uh, locations, okay, Canberra, Great World, uh, Katong, as well as our new uh, center at Sengkang Grand Mall. Okay. Uh, okay, so... Uh, what we have for all three subjects as a pre and post uh, assessment, okay? So the pre-assessment is kind of like to know where your child is at, yeah? Uh, and from there, you know, the, the teacher can actually assess uh, his or her weaknesses and um, focus on, on, on things that your child probably would uh, need, okay? And then, and after that, there'll be a post assessment to, to show the improvement your child has made, okay? So you yourself can see uh, what kind of improvement your child has made over that that one week of, uh, of uh, lessons. Okay, so uh, very briefly, you can see here the different things that we're focusing on. Okay, so uh, basically what we shared earlier, yeah, those are the things we're gonna focus on during the camp, yeah? Okay, so for example, for English, we're gonna focus a lot on composition and comprehension. Okay, we will talk about synthesis. There will be uh, some compre close. There's also a grammar. Uh, review as well, especially the trickier grammar questions, yeah? Okay, uh, for maths, yeah? Um, knowing the direct questions you may put one, recognizing question types, right? Uh, remainder concepts, equal fractions, changing ratios, area, parameter, angles, percentage, 
uh, increase and decrease number patterns. As I'm reading this, I'm, I'm myself, I'm, I'm wondering what's all that about. Obviously, my maths isn't very good. I should attend this. Uh, for science, uh, materials, magnets is what we've been shared earlier. Okay, things are uh, matter, water, cells, the different systems, uh, heat, light sources, okay, different forms of energy. And there will also be some uh, experiment, experiment based skills as well. So that should be quite fun. Yeah. Uh, this is the schedule, right? Okay, so uh, as you can see, the different subjects are running okay, on different dates at different locations. Uh, the QR code uh, over there, if you can, you can scan it and it will, it will lead you straight to the, to the, to the web page and you can, uh, there's more information there. You can even sign up through that, uh, to that link. Okay. And uh, yes, there's also a special offer for new students, right? So you can, if you sign up uh, for any subject, you can get 10% off the camp fees. So that's a great deal uh, for if you want to sign up for the camp. I'm just going to leave this here for a second in case you want to scan the QR code. Okay, parents, I see that there's uh, one question. Okay, if I need to mm. miss one day from a camp, possible mm. to get a replacement. Okay, so we would suggest that uh, you, you can do the replacement class at uh, another center because different centers, they run different subjects okay, at different timing. So uh, content-wise will not be affected because, for example, if you miss Wednesday, then you can go for the replacement uh, class on Wednesday at another center. Okay, thank you for your questions. Is there any more questions, parents? Any more questions? You can uh, either type in the chat, or you know, you can even unmute yourself and uh, just ask uh, in in the group here. <laughs> I see a question here, which asks, uh, "When the when will a Woodley Center open?" I believe Woodley is opening in term three. So um, we we were not offering it. Uh, we are not offering the camp there uh, this time round, unfortunately, because I think uh, the renovation and all that needs to be done. So probably in term term three will open for sure. Yeah, I think we're all looking forward to that as well. Lots of nice eateries there. Hey, just to add on, okay, uh, registration is still open. Okay, mm. if you have uh, any questions, okay, you can contact us to provide more info uh, and we can provide you with more information or you can uh, drop by our centers, okay, to find out okay, about the uh, success camp. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there's no other questions, okay, uh, I would like to, uh, we would like to thank okay, everyone for coming and joining us and we hope that okay our uh, sharing is useful to you all. Okay, have a good evening. Okay, thank you everyone. Thanks everyone.